uh, you guys can see the screen, right? You can see my screen, right? Uh, anyone just respond by yes or no? Yes, okay. Yes. okay, cool. So yeah, very quickly, we'll just uh, revisit, uh, you know, um, the stuff that we dis were discussing so that, you know, there is a little bit of continuity. So we discussed what we mean by a smart material and, um, you know, uh, the study of, uh, you know, transducer using smart material it encompasses, you know, studying electrical uh, uh, technology, uh, material science, and mechanical, right? So, oh, one second. Yeah. So, in the mechanical domain, uh, what are the things we uh, talk about, right? Um, so, we talk about uh, density. We, one second. Just hold on, please. One second. Yeah, so uh, we talk about uh, density, uh, mass, um, uh, displacement, uh, you know, all this uh, force, stress, uh, strain, Young's modulus, compliance, and in the electrical uh, domain, we talk about voltage, electric field, capacitor, you know, dielectric permittivity, and all of these, uh, we are going to see how it comes into play when we are studying this particular subject. So, um, electrical displacement and we also discussed um, you know uh, how we can quickly figure out if the material can be categorized under a smart material or not so we took an example and said that uh, if we increase the temperature uh, of this piece of material as shown and if we see that the length has changed to l plus delta l and width has changed from uh, you know w to w plus delta w um, then we see, we can say that the thermal energy, um, you know, has been converted to strain. And um, however, the reverse, if we were to, you know, impart uh, or, you know, if we were to pull the material and ensure strain is there, um, it may not mean, um, uh, it does not imply that, you know, it is going to get heated up. So, so this is an example where we can say there is no two-way transduction, meaning thermal energy um, is uh, getting converted into strain. Um, however, the reverse, the strain is not getting converted into thermal energy. So there is no two ways transduction and hence the material is not smart. That's what we uh, discussed. And uh, um, for, um, you know, for piezoelectric material, in the, in specifically in the con context of piezoelectric material, um, we talk of the transduction from electrical energy to mechanical energy, and uh, this qualifies as a smart material, right? And uh, last day we discussed um, that, you know, if we have a piezo material um, and if we put a, you know, force or a stress uh, in the direction as shown, then let's say we are going to, and we have a volt, voltmeter uh, across the terminals, um, then we are uh, going to see, let's say, a positive voltage across it, right? And this we can categorize as, you know, sensing or uh, the direct effect uh, because we are applying a mechanical uh, force, uh, a mechanical quantity, and we are able to observe an electrical, um, you know, readout from this, right? So we can say that you know the force uh, the information in terms of force has been converted into an information in the in the electrical domain which is voltage right and uh, what we also uh, said uh, or discussed with uh, is you know the inverse effect is um, um, you know if we apply uh, a voltage as shown here then um, um, the length um, or y actually changes to y minus delta y. And this we can, and we'll, we'll talk about more uh, about this phenomena uh, more quickly um, um, after this slide. And this we can say that this is nothing but, uh, you know, actuating. So why, why would we call this as actuating? Because from electrical uh, domain, 
we are um, generating a mechanical behavior. So we can turn this as an actuator, right? And uh, so in other words, we have converted a voltage information to strain. That's what we saw, right? And this is the direct and the inverse effect. So now um, we also, after that, we saw what are the fundamental relation. We talked about, uh, um, you know, uh, a material and we talked about, we tried to derive a relation between the spring constant um, K and the Young's modulus uh, Y. And we derived that uh, from basic fundamental principles. And we said that, uh, you know, this is how the spring constant and the Young's modulus is um, related, right? Uh, so this was, I think, pretty straightforward, uh, not a big deal, right, in terms of uh, de derivation. Uh, another thing that we discussed and brought a new term or terminology last time was el el elastic compliance, right? Uh, we denoted this by a small s, and which is nothing but the inverse of the Young's modulus. And what we also said is a low stiffness means a higher compliance. Meaning, um, and we give an example also in real life, right? Like, for example, the students who are actually following in class and they, uh, whatever we are discussing, uh, they are able to kind of uh, um, assimilate that, right? And follow and, you know, go with the flow of the class. They are more compliant, right? So similarly, we can say the material is more compliant when it is behaving as per the way we want it to behave, right? For example, here we had applied a force and we are trying to stretch the material. And if the material is compliant, then it is going to move uh, in the direction um, of the force, right? Um, so lower stiffness means uh, higher compliance. And um, uh, this is how the, you know, the coefficients are um, kind of denoted. Um, S is equal to inverse of uh, Y. Okay, so this is where we stopped last time. Uh, okay, I think we discussed Poisson's ratio also, right? And why this minus uh, term comes here. That also I think uh, we discussed because we wanted uh, the ratio to be um, uh, a positive, um, you know, a positive quantity. So, you know, the reason this uh, negative term is introduced uh, to kind of, if you look at this example, we are stretching the length. And if we say that the volume of the material is going to remain constant, uh, which means, um, you know, the density is not changing. So if the density doesn't change, the volume remains constant because the mass remains constant, right? So um, if the length is increasing in um, X direction, um, the width, which is in the Y direction, that has reduced. So which means it will have a negative, um, you know, this delta W will be negative. And if we were to look at the strain um, epsilon Y, so that will be a negative number. So to ensure that you know the overall Poisson's ratio remains a positive quantity, we have introduced um, you know this negative term. Okay, and then we also discussed polling, right? Um, polling we have been discussing in the earlier classes also. Uh, why it is done or what is the significance of polling, right? So if we receive a material um, from someone um, without you know any let's say markings there that you know this is a you know positive terminal or the negative terminal we can figure out by you know just having a voltmeter we can just measure um, you know across the two faces and see what is the polling direction so for example in this the electric field has been shown in the internal existing electric field is in this direction so the polling direction must be opposite to um, uh, uh, to this, right, uh, to the internal electric field, right? And uh, uh, so I think the key thing that we also said is the direction of the internal electric field and the dipole moment, right? So the dipole moment, uh, you know, points from the negative to the positive uh, charge. That's how we define the dipole. And that is the same as, you know, the external uh, field that we would have applied, which is the polling direction, right? And uh, so this has been the polling direction. Um, and with that, um, I think uh, let's move on to, so this is what we kind of covered. I just, you know, for the last five, seven minutes, I just wanted to have a brief, brief recap and then let's move on. So the direct and the indirect effect one more time. 
So please note this. So we have a material with a uh, with an existing um, you know polarization in this direction. So the extra, so this arrow means the polling direction. So this is what we are going to follow as a convention um, that you know the polling direction uh, is going to tell us what is the alignment of the charges inside the material. So the polling direction is from you know down to up. So that means we have the negative charges here and the positive charges here, right? So now to this material, if we apply an external force or an external stress, and as I had mentioned earlier, uh, that we are going to use different letters to you know, signify stress. We are not going to talk about sigma. I mean, no, not uh, how the mechanical folks uh, denoted, but we are going to use different letters. So let's say the stress uh, we decided uh, we will define as capital T. So if we are applying a stress in this direction, what is going to happen to the to the charge uh, uh, that was there um, in, the, in the material? So if you see what is going to happen is when we are stretching it, right? Um, in the diagram, uh, it is clear that you know um, the, the the charges ap appearing across the plates, right? That is increasing. And why is it increasing? Because uh, if you are applying a stress, the material will behave in a way to oppose. I mean, inherently, um, just like in human beings. Inherently, we don't like to change, right? We, whatever we are, uh, inherently, you know, um, there is a like, you know, um, there is an affinity not to change, right? So similarly, in materials, right, we are applying a stress, and the internal charge that is going to develop will be such that, you know, um, the stress uh, that is being applied, the internal charge will develop in order to oppose the stress. And why is the charge increasing? Because if you see, we are pull, we are actually stretching the material in this direction and we are having more charges coming uh, inside the material, right? So what it means is, so if we see we have actually more charges, right? So basically, we because we have more charges, the material is trying to, you know, create an internal electric field, a stronger electric field, which will ensure that these ions are pulling each other harder, right? I mean, overall, the existence of the internal electric field is going to be in such a direction such that, so basically we're trying to stretch in one direction, whereas the internal field that is developing is in a direction such that these two plates are getting pull towards each other, right? So it is opposing the force that we have applied. So this has to be very clearly understood. If we are applying a force, external force, the charges that they're developing will be such that it is going to oppose the external um, force, right? Okay. Um, now, what happens here? So let's say, Again, we have a piece of material and the polling direction, the same material, polling direction is shown as um, uh, you know we sh uh, saw in uh, saw here, the same material. And now instead of applying a force, we are applying a voltage as shown in this direction. And now we have to predict what is going to happen to this L plus delta L. So in this case, L is this, right? So earlier, uh, the, the original length in this direction was L, and this is changing to L plus delta L. So what will be delta L in this case? Will it be positive or negative? Can someone take a shot at it, please? Give me a response will be before. Positive, yeah. right? It will be? Positive. Delta L will be positive, okay. Anyone else? Because if like delta L is positive, if voltage is trying to like uh, uh, reduce mm. the distance between positive and negative charge, so the length must have increased. That's why it is uh, like it will oppose uh, the uh, initial. Voltage. Okay, good. So good that I've messed you up. Okay, so there's a, there's a good answer. Good try, Ayush. Uh, I must appreciate uh, the way you are thinking. But but think like this. Unlike 
what is happening good um, this is really beautiful the answer that you gave so um, unlike when you're applying a mechanical force the material adjusts in a way to oppose the mechanical force right however when in the electrical domain as ayush mentioned we have applied the battery so this is a external battery in fact i'm better off um, yeah so this is the battery um, that we have right so the external electric field we have actually applied an external electric field now remember the electric field is an electric field right i mean the charges that are there so basically we are applying an electric field in this direction right so the charges these charges are going to move in the direction of the electric field the positive charges is going to move in the direction of the electric field and the negative charge of course is going to move in the opposite direction right so what does that imply what it implies is these charges are going to come closer to each other right and because of that delta l will be actually negative it will not be positive so ayush was like mostly right in observing that you know we have applied an external electric field and the direction of the electric field just note also one thing the direction of the electric field is opposite to the direction of the pulling direction pulling direction is when the material was manufactured we have discussed pulling right and why it is done and all that right i think um, one of you asked a very nice question uh, about why pulling is done and all that right we discussed that so now if you note we have applied a battery a voltage source which is opposite to the pulling direction and what that has created is it creates an internal electric field and the positive charges and the negative charges are going to follow the electric field right so unlike in the first scenario where you know the material property comes into picture here the electrical property comes into picture right so the electrical charges that are there because of you know inherently whatever was there they are just going to follow the electrical laws so it's going to comply uh, we have applied an electric field in this direction the positive charges are going to move along that negative charges are going to move opposite to that i mean opposite to the external field which means the charges are coming closer to each other right and because of that um delta l is negative is this clear so this is very important because things are going to get more and more complicated and it is very important to understand this phenomena so that you know we can figure out the maths um, in the next few slides this is clear right no questions any questions up to this point okay so let's move on so now this is going to be a Im very important slide so so now if you see right we are talking of uh, this kind of material both in mechanical terms and in electrical terms in the last slide uh, what we discussed was we showed how the material is going to behave when we have a force applied which is a mechanical quantity and how it is going to behave when you have a external battery or a, a voltage potential applied right which is in uh, which is an electrical um, uh, you know uh, stimulus right so let's look at the so we are going to talk of this material in both domains mechanical domain as well as electrical domain and we are going to see how they interact with each other and try to develop the maths involving both these domains okay so the mechanical first law that we had already talked about is this right so this law so what is capital s guys capital s is nothing but strain um, um you know instead of epsilon and all that uh, we are going to um i think we discussed i mean i mentioned this last time also right we are going to use alternative letters to uh, denote our um, equations so uh, you know according to the basic hooke's law that we have we uh, the strain uh, is proportional to the stress and all that right so we are so this is nothing but you can say a form of a hooke's law s is nothing but the strain s is the compliance which is inverse of the young's modulus and t is the stress right so this is one mechanical domain property 
the electrical uh, domain property equivalent to that is D equal to epsilon times capital E. So D, what is D? So D is the dielectric displacement. What we mean by dielectric displacement is, you know, the charge that moves be, uh, because of uh, an electric field that is applied. We will call that as a dielectric displacement, and that is proportional to E, right? This is from the basic, uh, you know, um, a simple relation with voltage and the capacitor Q equal to CV, right? This is one form of that equation, right? So electrical uh, is D is equal to epsilon times um, E, and epsilon in this case is permittivity, which is equal to again epsilon zero, the per permittivity of air uh, and the relative permittivity of the material, right? And epsilon, we are going to not go into, you know, we are not going to talk about epsilon zero and epsilon R, we are just going to talk about the absolute permittivity. So this is epsilon times the electric field, uh, right? D, capital D is the um, uh, displacement, right? So these two are the domain relationships. Now, what are the transducer relationship? The direct, as we have discussed, the direct phenomena is electrical to mechanical. So if we see here, the independent variable is electrical. The right hand side of the equation is electrical. And we are converting this to a mechanical quantity S. S is nothing but strain. I keep repeating S is strain and capital T is stress. So the strain and why is it inverse? Because we are talking from electrical to mechanical, right? So this equation we can write as S equal to small d times E. And what is D? D is the piezoelectric constant, right? Uh, one of the coefficients that uh, there are many other coefficients. So D is one of them, right? So the strain um, S is proportional to the electric field that we have applied, right? S is equal to D times E, right? And the direct, what and why are you calling this direct? Is mechanical to electrical, right? So mechanical, why mechanical to electrical? On the left hand side, how are you going to say that this equation is a direct equation? We're going to look at the equation and see what is the independent variable. The independent variable is always on the right hand side of our equation, right? In any equation that we write, when we write y is equal to fx, what is the independent variable? Independent variable is x and the dependent variable is y. Meaning if we are changing x, y will take a value based on the function f, right? So in this case, the independent variable is T, right, which is mechanical, and the dependent variable is P, which is polarization, uh, which again we discussed earlier, right? What uh, What is the unit of P? It's actually uh, the charge uh, per unit area, right? So the mechanical quantity T, uh, which is nothing but stress, is resulting in an electrical quantity P polarization, so this is the direct effect, right? Now, so now let me erase this. Because now we are going to see something. Um, uh, yeah. So now, so D, we have uh, discussed the coupling coefficient and the uh, polarization P is the polar polarization. So now if we combine the actuator equation into one. So if you see, so this is the mechanical relationship we had, and this is the transducer relationship. So the, the first two equations, they are, I'm calling them as domain relationship. Why? Because it will be there for any material, right? For any material without being a transducer, even if I, you know, even if I, even if we don't look at uh, the right side of the slide and we look at only the first two equations, this guy and this guy, these two equations are going to be valid, right, for any material, right? And that's why we call this as a domain relationship. It has got nothing to do with, you know, whether the material is a smart or, you know, we can use it as a transducer or not. It has got nothing to do with that, absolutely, right? However, because we are talking of, transducer, 
right, where we have both uh, the mechanical property as well as the electrical property, both the equations will come into picture. So if we see the strain is proportional to stress, and also for a transducer in showing the inverse effect going from mechanical, I mean going from electrical to mechanical. So I can combine this guy and this equation right together. And I can say that if I have an actuator, and why are we saying that this is an actuator? Because actuator means we are trying, we are moving something on the application of an electric field or something, right? I mean, some electrical information is getting converted into mechanical information. So that's why we call this an actuator. So for an actuator, we can combine these two equation and write that the overall overall strain will be a sum total of the mechanical quantity and because of the electrical field that you have applied. Now note one thing so far in this equation. So, so what is not explained in this equation? Can somebody tell me whatever I've written here? It's very important. See guys, the, the point is not to remember the equation, right? But where the equation is coming from, there has to be an intuitive feel as engineers, right? Uh, and as we develop the course, you will see my stress will be to come up with intuitive answers, not to like kind of mug up and remember big equations. No, that is not the goal. The goal is we should be able to understand, you know, uh, each and every variable that is coming. So can someone tell me what is something new that we are observing in this particular equation other than this, I mean, the addition that I have done. Anything that you are not able to understand in this equation? And there is something that I have not talked about in this equation. What is that? Yes. Yes, S E. Now somebody can say, sir, you talked about S and that is compliance, but suddenly from where are you getting this, right? This subscript E, E kaha se aagya, right? So let's see. So, so we are going to talk about, um, one second. So we are going to talk about S E. It is actually compliance, but in a certain boundary condition, we are going to talk about that, but this part, so far is clear, right? That the total strain developed is a sum total of the mechanical property that the material has. And in addition to that, the electrical, because it's a transducer, we are not talking about any dumb material, right? We are talking of smart material. We are, we are a smart class and we are talking about smart material. So because it's a smart material, hence we are using this as a transducer, which means that there will be also a conversion of one domain to the other domain. So when we are talking of the overall stream, we are just adding them up, right? So actuator is one thing, and the other thing is a sensor. So an inverse of, I mean, uh, whatever is an actuator, um, the sensor does just the opposite, right? Uh, an actuator converts, an electrical uh, signal into a mechanical signal. And how can we even say that the blue, blue equation is for an actuator? Because again, by looking at the left side of the equation, which is nothing but the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is in mechanical domain, right? S is strain. And that is the reason. And strain is a, is a mechanical quantity. You remember we discussed those domain properties a few slides back, right? We said that you know to study material, there are some mechanical terms that we use and electrical terms that we use, and strain was one of them, right? So because the dependent variable is strain, that means it's an actuator, meaning that is the overall output. I mean, overall output quantity is in mechanical domain. A sensor is opposite, right? A sensor, what do we mean by a sensor? That if there is a vibration or if there is a force or maybe if there is a heat, um, you know, the sensor is going to give us an electrical output, which we can actually probably put it in a display and say that, hey, this is the electrical voltage or current or whatever, right? So a sensor, the dependent variable will be in electrical domain, which is D. 
and D we know as the dielectric displacement. It's an electrical variable. So a sensor. So just like we combine the first two equations, this guy and this guy, we combine for a sensor. We will combine both of these guys. The electrical uh, relation, which for any dielectric material it will. So so the first uh, so this guy this equation is valid for any dielectric material, right? It need not be a smart material or you know whatever. But for if it's a dielectric material, it will it will follow this relationship. However, because we are talking of a smart material, this guy also comes into picture. And now, just like you know, for the overall uh, strain, we combined or we added both of those these two equations in the um, you know electrical domain. We are going to do the same thing. And just like um, we talked about S E this term, please note. Very silently, I have introduced another subscript epsilon T. It is not permittivity, but permittivity under certain conditions. We are going to talk about this. So the actuator equation is again nothing but a com com combination of the electrical and the um, uh, I mean, uh, if you see basically both mechanical uh, equations have com combined into the actuator and the both electrical equations are combined into the sensor, right? Any confusion up to this point? Uh, I understand we have not talked about S, E and Epsilon T. We are going to talk about that, but any conf confusion so far? OK, so am I going too slow, too fast, or do you think it, it's OK, right? I mean, um, anyway, you guys will give feedback, um, uh, anonymous feedback, and, and it doesn't matter. Even if you say that, sir, no, it's too boring or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, too fast or too slow, it's OK. I mean, or maybe uh, you're not able to explain properly. That is also fine in the sense that, you know, a feedback is a feedback, right? It has to be true, and I should be able to accept that. But please let me know if you know uh, anything in the class you are not able to follow so far. I've tried to keep things simple. Uh, so, so far it's okay, right? Okay. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. okay. So now, now that we have written a bunch of two equations, we are going to name them. And this form of equation we are going to call as strain charge form. And why? Uh, we are going to look at different forms of the same equation, meaning the same material. If you were to work um, in an electronics company, right, in a sensor design company, you will be, and there are you know pretty good sensor design companies, right? You will be, let's say, uh, and if you're a system designer there and you are buying a piezoelectric material, you will be dealing with exactly these equations, right? And uh, you know, human beings, uh, we have a tendency to, you know. Um, have our own terminology, right? I mean, just like in religion, uh, you know, um, in Hindu, in Hindu, Hinduism, we call uh, God as Bhagwan. Uh, you know, Muslims will call uh, the same uh, thing as you know Allah and whatever, right? So similarly, um, you know, in the engineering world also, uh, you know, the same properties are described in different ways. So this bunch of these two equations are called as strain charge form. And that is evident why it is called strain and charge, because S stands for strain and D, which is actually dielectric displacement. It is nothing but in a form of, uh, you know, uh, quantifying charge, right? So um, we call this a strain charge form of the equation. And there are three other forms of the same equation. We are going to look at that carefully. And then we are going to see how the, I mean, the equations are going to become relevant when we talk about you know material properties, uh, the same material property. So now I'm showing a particular condition here. So please note this is very very important and very very uh, you know without assimilating this, um, then subsequent slides right will all go tangent. So please understand this carefully. So we have taken a piece of material, and what is this arrow that we have shown? Can someone tell me what is the significance of this arrow? Polarization, a polling direction. Correct. Correct. Polling direction, which means the negative charges with 
uh, I mean, in 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 if we take the material and if we um, see, you know, um, in which uh, plates we have the negative and the positive charges, the negative and the positive charges will be like this, right? And that means this was the external um, pulling direction when the material was manufactured or fa fabricated, right? So now what we have done is we are again applying a stress, stress T, right? Please note one thing. I have shorted, I have shorted both the faces of the material with a wire, right? Under this condition, so what are we doing? Essentially, what are we doing? So let's go back, let's go back few slides. I think this slide itself. So what did we see? So let me erase this. So what did we see, guys? That this was the material that we had. And this was the polling direction, right? And what I had mentioned here is when we apply a stress in this direction, the charges were increasing in a way to oppose, in a way to oppose the external charge, I mean external force, right? Now, the same thing, what I have done and same scheme, if you see what I have done essentially is real. I am I mean, I am pulling it. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of stretching it in the direction as shown, right? So what will happen if I'm trying to stretch the direction? So charges are going to accumulate and it is going to oppose the external stress that you're applying, right? That's what would happen in general. However, what I have done is I have shorted the two terminals two faces, right? So what will happen under that condition if we try to do, if we, if we do that, right? In comparison to the previous, um, previous scenario where, you know, I said that we are, we are going to stretch and the charges accumulated on the faces of the material in order to oppose the external stress. Here, what is going to happen? This is the polling direction. And let's say we do have some positive and some negative charges pre-existing, and then we have applied the stress. What happens then, ideally speaking, or normally speaking, if we didn't have the wire, there would be more charges that would be appearing, right? Positive and negative charges, it would appear. But now, because I have shorted the two phases, Basis of real, what am I doing? What I'm doing is I'm ensuring any additional, any additional. So basically, these. So let me. So let's say because of the polling, we had let's say two charges just to kind of make things simple to understand. Or let's say we'll say because of the polling, we had three charges on each of the faces because of the polling, and that would exist no matter what, even if I short this, this will exist because that is the material characteristics, right? I've fabricated the material such that the net center of charge for the positive um, um, uh, cations or the negative anions is such that I have a net three, let's say positive charges appearing on the face, um, uh, on the top face and the bottom three negative charges. So even if I short, that will remain like that because that's a material property. We have not done anything. It will stay like that. But now when we are applying a force, a stress, the material tries to develop more charges in order to in order to oppose the stress. But but by what I'm doing by shorting these two faces, I am actually I'm not going to allow that additional charges to accumulate because of the wire that is there externally. We are going to short. So what is going to happen? This positive and negative charges are going to merge and there is going to be no additional charge that will accumulate. So what are we say doing? Because we have this external wire, we are 
storing only mechanical energy. When we are stretching it, see anyway we are stretching it. So this guy, the length will have to increase, right? Because that has to happen, right? But then the electrical energy or the electrical charges which would have accumulated because I have shorted this, there is no electrical energy that is getting stored. So under that condition, so basically, I can say that the net, I mean the electric field that I've applied across the terminals, that is let's say zero, right? Not let's say because we have a wire, we, we are saying that this electric field is zero and zero is nothing but a constant, right? It's a constant number. So under this condition, if we say that the compliance, so compliance coefficient, so this is a material property. So if we measure the compliance under the condition where electric field E is a constant, it need not be zero. This is an example of when E is equal to zero. So when we are the compliance coefficient under the condition that there is no electric field or constant electric field, under that condition we are going to show the compliance mate, I mean compliance coefficient S as S subscript E. So what that means is E is a constant quantity when we are measuring compliance. And why do we have to do this? Because these materials, they are smart materials and they exhibit properties both in the mechanical as well as in the electrical domain. So when we are actually specifying a coefficient, a mechanical coefficient, we should specify under what electrical condition was that coefficient measured, right? Because this will change if the electrical uh, condition around that material is different, this coefficient will change. And why that will happen? Because it's a transducer, because it's a smart material. It, 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 it actually, you know, has electrical properties which will impact the mechanical properties and the mechanical properties impacting electrical properties. Because this, you know, two, um, you know, there is a cross coupling between domains. When we are specifying a coefficient in one particular domain, we should mention under what condition that particular coefficient is measured. So S is a compliance coefficient, which is in mechanical domain. Compliance is not an electrical thing, right? So when we are talking of a mechanical property, a mechanical coefficient, under what electrical condition we are measuring that, that should be specified. So S subscript E means it's a compliance coefficient measured under constant electric field, right? Right, guys? So, so like, can you please again repeat how will the electric field be constant even after we apply T? Yes. So if this wire, so what, what is this wire doing? So what a wire does, right? It ensures that, so when we are shorting, right? Two terminals, right? What are, so what, what is the external electric field we are applying? It's actually zero, right? I mean, zero means it's, I mean, there is no, basically any, any additional charges that are accumulating, I'm kind of giving them a free path to move from one phase to other, right? So essentially what I'm ensuring is there is no electrical energy is getting stored because I'm the moment an electrical uh, energy, I mean uh, a charge appears, I'm kind of wiping it off by shorting it, right? So basically the energy that is stored in the material only is pure mechanical energy because of stressing it, I mean stretching it, nothing more. Any electrical charge which would have applied other, which would have appeared otherwise, I am killing that charge by shorting them, shorting them, right? And that, in other words, I am saying that there is no electric field, external electric field, there is no electric field uh, meaning it is equal to zero. And under that condition, I am measuring what is the compliance, meaning if I um, apply if I apply a, a force, how much will the material stress? Under this condition, if I pull the material, it will have a certain compliance coefficient versus 
if i measure the compliance coefficient without shorting so that will be something else we are going to talk of that as well we are going to so let just bear with me i will spend uh, uh, you know some more time on this uh, we'll take some examples to to drive home uh, this concept so the point is uh, s e is nothing but compliance coefficient at constant electric field so basically now so I've, this brings us to the point of understanding boundary conditions and we are going to spend probably the next class uh, in discussing boundary conditions and how um, you know these coefficients come into picture and you know do a comparative analysis and also other than strain charge form we will also look at other forms of the equation we are going to do that next class but is this kind of understandable how this equation and guys most likely you will not find um, um, not most likely, I mean, maybe it is there, but you will not find these kind of explanation being given in, uh, you know, in textbooks per se, and you may not even find uh, these equations in a very straightforward way. Um, so it's very important to understand uh, from where the equations are coming, because then you don't have to mug up, right? Uh, it's a pretty straightforward way of looking at. So this is a very basic, um, you know, these are very basic four equations that we have and how these equations combine for an actuator and for a sensor and what is an actuator equation how will you identify what is a sensor equation how will you identify that also we discussed right just by looking at the dependent variable the variable which is appearing on the left hand side of the equation right and so s and y do we have to um, i mean when we are talking of single domain relationships then we don't bring in all the subscript uh, business, right? Then we just say that, okay, this is my, you know, compliance S and my permittivity, uh, whatever. We don't talk about any given condition, but because we are talking of material where we have two domains interacting with each other, we have to specify. So when we are talking of permittivity, we are going to talk about permittivity when the T means what T is stress when the stress is constant we are going to talk about permittivity in that given condition so basically somebody can say that you know so what are the um, um so compliance we have s suffix e right and what can be the other form uh, of compliance matrix can somebody tell so if you look at these equations right if you look at this equation these two equations right you are able to figure out that compliance when we are talking of compliance we are talking of a constant electric field right but can we think of compliance coefficient in some other um you know some other electrical um um like e means what electrical field so in and in some in certain electrical condition we are talking of se so what can be another coefficient uh, compliance coefficient s under what condition can we think of that so if you look at the electrical equation side right we we have e and we have p or we have d right in this case right so we can talk of compliance coefficient at constant d as well meaning at constant dielectric displacement and we are going to talk about the relationship of s e and s d but first it is important to understand why we are talking of uh, coefficients under con under certain given condition and how we are denoting it so when we say compliance coefficient s e what we mean by that is we are talking of measuring the compliance coefficient of a particular material with a constant electric field and the example of a constant electric field zero is also a constant number right i mean somebody can say sir instead of e equal to zero if i apply a battery here will that still be se instead of shorting like this right if i apply a, a fixed battery of let's say five volt will that be se or something else can somebody tell so it will be se only but the relation okay. will be like delta s and delta t yeah yes very good Shubham. yes 
it will be se only but then that will be some other ac it will be se under that given condition and why it will be se because see essentially i mean we have a wire is what it is ensuring that the potential difference between these two plates are zero but instead of zero i can have a battery and uh, so the battery also what that will ensure is if there are additional charges that are accumulating on these faces the battery will absorb that the battery is like a infinite uh, um, um, you can say an ocean of charge and if few charges appear uh, the battery will say hey what, what are you doing there i have a lot of space in my room um, please come in right it will absorb the uh, positive and the negative charge so that will also be ac but in in a given condition of e equal to whatever five or whatever right we will have to specify that so what is se and what is sd we are going to revisit we are going to stop today because this is very important we are going to go a little bit slow in the next few slides to understand how the equations are and this is one form of the equation as i said strain and charge there are three other forms and we are going to discuss that um, but please um, kind of uh, go through this uh, uh, concept if you have time at home or whatever i i am sure you don't have time but uh, if you can think about it and then we'll take it up next class any other questions uh, sir uh, yes uh, so you said that uh, we can we can uh, change the like we can replace the you know, sensor sensor uh, sensor mm -hmm. by a capacitor and mm -hmm. we, if we like uh, join the two terminals of the capacitor then the charge will be zero across them right but here the, there will be some charge as you are saying that uh, there will be no additional okay. charge but there there will be the pulling huh. charge that we have previously yes. induced in there yeah. yes because the reason is right um this these charges right you can assume that these charges are kind of um uh, hard pressed it is kind of imbibed into that meaning it is a, a this, this see the net charge in the material is anyway zero right but the way we have pulled the material right um it is going to uh, i mean that that pulling charge what the residual charge that is going to remain because that's a inherent characteristics of the material that is not going to change any additional thing that is happening because of the stress that you are applying that will be absorbed whatever was there was there right because that you can think of that see forget that there is a i mean just that we are saying that we have pulled the material and because of which we are denoting that pulling direction with an arrow and saying that uh, what that means is there are dipoles existing in the material and uh, those are like negative and positive charges that are there by by nature it is there and if we apply um, you know an electric uh, in a battery or whatever then of course uh, we will have more charges uh, or less charges or whatever depending on the direction of the uh, in the um battery but uh, or or let's say if in this case we have shorted it right when the, the moment we have shorted it uh, the potential of this plate and this plate uh, the potential uh, difference is zero right so basically any new additional charge that appears will be kind of sucked away and that's why we are calling it as se um am i clear nayan or okay sir yeah maybe i'm not very clear huh, from your answer <laughs> but, but just think about it or you can probably read up some material and see if that helps but think about it um so the polling direction is it's like actually i have an example to show in the next few slides which will probably make it clear that even so we will talk about an example that even if the material dimensions are changing meaning even if there is strain there is no stress that also we are going to um, so i i think uh, we are almost uh, out of time 1157 it is we'll stop here and we'll revisit this nayan uh, you have to bear with me because uh, yeah next class we'll again revisit this okay and see if we can clear this okay okay guys um, thank you and yep uh, have a good day